All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the first session of the Ukraine Dialogues, a four-week short course. I'm Keegan Lundman, a senior studying history, Russian, and German at the University of Montana. I lived in Kiev, Ukraine for six weeks last summer to study Russian. I'm Cameron Vaughn, a program coordinator at the Marine and Mike Mansfield Center and was founded by an act of Congress in 1983 to foster globally minded leaders of integrity. Our programs are supported by people like you. We would like to express our appreciation to those that made a donation in lieu of a course fee. Your support allows us to continue providing impactful public programming and scholarships and aid to humanitarian causes. We would like to thank Missoula Community Access Television for recording today's discussion as part of a media assistance grant provided to us. We would also like to thank Elizabeth Dove for the idea of the dialogues and for creating the beautiful design of the promotional materials. We are honored to have with us today expert speakers with in-depth knowledge of Ukraine to provide context of the complex political history of Ukraine-Russia relations. During my time in Kyiv, I had the opportunity to meet many proud Ukrainians and to visit memorials to those who fought relentlessly in 2013 and 2014 to give Ukrainians their voices, to elevate human rights, and to assert their continued independence in the face of subversion. Now we must continue to support Ukraine's sovereignty and its people throughout the war Russia has waged. The Mansfield Center and UM's Russian program are dedicated to helping students and community members understand the history of Ukraine and its unique identity. Professor Oksana Nezhevenko joins us from Spain, where she is residing after fleeing her home in Ukraine. Ms. Nezhevenko is a Mansfield Center alumni and is an associate professor at the National University of Kiev Molya. Chris Smith served as an economic officer in Kiev, Ukraine, and is author of Ukraine's Revolt, Russia's Revenge. As a career member of the United States Foreign Service, he has also served in China, Estonia, and Lesotho. Our speakers will address viewer questions today, so please post your questions in the Q&A box throughout the presentation. Professor Nezhevenko, we are so grateful that you are safe and could join us for these sessions. Let's begin with you. Thank you very much. I will first start sharing my screen. Please, can you give me feedback if you can see it well? I hope it's working. Please, can you tell me if you can see my presentation? Mm -hmm. It's visible. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so I would like to start today my presentation with uh, thanking you, uh, you all. First of all, Dina for inviting me, uh, the Mansfield Center that I know personally because I was there, Un University of Montana that I also adore. Um, and all the participants here uh, who joined this course, uh, this four week session and who have interest in, uh, in these topics. I will try to be um, as more useful for you as it is possible. Um, it is honor for me to be the voice of Ukraine in these um, sessions. Uh, however, mm, yeah, I'm sorry if I'm a bit emotional today. I was trying to to calm down before, but you know, some of you who spoke about my country, it's again came back. Um, unfortunately, I speak not from Ukraine, but I speak for Ukraine. Um, yeah, I'm in Spain currently and uh, temporarily. Um, so today I'm going to talk about some of my background. I'm going to talk about the reasons that I see in the current war. Um, and if there is some uh, Q&A session, uh, I will also be happy to address your questions. Uh, so I want to start with some pictures. Um, yeah. Yes, it's moving. Um, it's me, um, a couple of years ago, completing my first marathon. I'm an addicted runner. Uh, it's me doing my second uh, favorite job besides running, teaching. Uh, I actually found out that I don't really have many pictures from teaching, so you please do these pictures, you never know, but uh, yeah, I didn't expect this uh, to have two in my life, so uh, it's always better to think in advance, which I did not do before. 
Uh, it's me doing some public talks. Uh, it's me receiving PhD diploma in economics from the Minister of Economics, uh, sorry, Education. This is me uh, doing some like posing, modeling in Montana. Mm, amazing state, really, I believe, the most beautiful state uh, in the United States. Um, this is me with my uh, SUSI team uh, after the trip to Montana, and I lost my passport. So my uh, group mates helped me find this passport. Uh, yeah, my Ukrainian passport, uh, the most precious document for me. Uh, this is me with my husband uh, doing some like sport tournament, uh, completed it successfully. And uh, 10 months after, uh, our daughter was born. <laughs> Yeah, I, I will try really to be as uh, uh, who. And this is my daughter who is enjoying peaceful life here in Spain. Um, and this is what my everyday starts for the 41st day since uh, the start of the war. Um, I'm checking um, how many uh, Russian troops we killed, how many uh, helicopters, a aircrafts, uh, tanks were just destroyed. Uh, and I get excited when these numbers grow. You know, psychologists, they say that it's fine to hate in these conditions. And it's a very new state for me because I'm an extremely peaceful person. Um, yeah, this is what this is. Uh, and a uh, couple of more pictures. This is me and my daughter in the bomb shelter, really never imagining. And uh, this is my husband driving us to the border. And uh, this is the peaceful sky that I saw when crossing the border. <clears throat> this is my child playing in another home. <laughs> yeah, and I'm finishing with the pictures because I feel I cannot stand it. And this is us driving to Spain. Mm, Spain hosted us, my sister lives here for some time. Uh, and yeah, uh, we are here to, um, to save our lives, our daughter's life and uh, for, more than 4 million people left Ukraine, according to United Nations, as I did. 90% um, of those people are willing to come back home. Um, almost the same number of these people believe in the victory of Ukraine. Uh, so really high numbers. I'm also one of those 80% and one of those 90% who are on the positive side. Yeah, let's go on. And uh, we talk about the content. So why and the context. Uh, talking about the context and the reasons for this war, uh, you know, I'm not a political uh, scientist, I'm not a sociologist, I'm not the person uh, who is uh, perfect in the history, but uh, living in Ukraine for all my life, uh, being a huge patriot, uh, I have like a couple of my reasons, and I decided to um, have six reasons, uh, three of them belong to Russia and three of them belong to Ukraine. And I will share them with you. Definitely, there will be more uh, reasons coming up in the next sessions, maybe from another speakers. So we will be very happy uh, com completing this puzzle together. Uh, so the reason about um, Russia and uh, yeah, just just why did I show you these pictures? Not to make you cry, not to make me cry, um, but to show you that uh, I'm not um, I'm I'm normal. Like I'm not a terrorist. I'm not a Nazi uh, because Russians believe that they are freeing Ukraine from Nazists uh, or terrorists. So yeah, one of these people is in front of you. Maybe you will think that I'm not one of these kinds. So again, to the context. Um, and the first reason that I believe Russia started this war is uh, their um, strive for um, regaining empire. What do I mean by that? Uh, and first I went to the dictionary, the Merriam-Webster dictionary to define what is the empire and what is the imperialism. So please uh, let me quote it. The policy, practice or advocacy of extending the power and dominion of a nation, especially by direct territorial acquisitions or by gaining indirect control over the political or economic life of other areas. Like every word of this definition strikes to me, uh, what they are doing. This is definitely imperialism um, and what is called Russian Federation uh, maybe should change to Ra Russian Empire because they are definitely doing uh, this. Uh, we do not need to go far. We need to just look on the map. So this is the map of current Russia. 
and uh, the boundary of former Soviet Union, part of which Ukraine was, was also. So you can see that uh, Ukraine is it's not like very little, it's not very big, but the size is um, quite, quite large compared to European countries. Uh, Ukraine is actually the largest European country by the territory. Mm, it's larger than France, which is second. Um, so Russia sort of always wanted to capture it. Throughout uh, 18th century, throughout 19th century, um, throughout 20th century with the great famine, um, letting my Ukrainian people strive from hunger. Uh, and my uh, grandmother told me a lot about that. Um, killing um, poets, uh, writers, uh, singers, those people who portrayed Ukrainian nation, Ukrainian culture, Ukrainian language. Um, and as you see from our battle now, they did not succeed in this. So this, our strive for freedom is really large. Um, but Russia is doing not only bad stuff in Ukraine. Um, there are a couple of other problematic regions um, in the countries that are not, I would say, so useful for them. For example, Georgia, it's the second country, uh, not, not the second, it's the same country as Ukraine, who is very fighter for freedom. And uh, Russia, I would say, orchestrated um, some problematic areas there like Abkhazia, Ossetia, um, the same scenario as it was in the Eastern Ukraine, uh, in Donetsk, Luhansk, or in Crimea, um, another uh, problematic area in Azerbaijan, Nagorno Karabakh, and in Moldova, Transnistria. So the scenario was quite simple. Um, they go there, the Russians go there, uh, and they have something like a referendum. Uh, so people vote that they want to be part of Russia. Um, Russians on our territory vote that they want to be part of Russia. It was proven many times. Um, and then they have the right to protect these Russians on other territories. Well, uh, this is definitely an imperialism for me. Uh, and the second reason uh, that I find is uh, strong propaganda. Um, the reason uh, for this was that uh, we in our countries, we let this strong propaganda flourish. Uh, it was through um, Russian speaking medias, it was through Ukrainian speaking medias, but um, sending Russian messages, it was through um, Russian politicians, it was through watching Russian TV until it was allowed. Um, and there were very, very funny examples of this propaganda, like uh, Ukrainians eating children, um, because we speak Ukrainian language and we eat Russian children. Well, no proof for that. Um, they always try to rewrite history. Uh, the funniest thing I heard recently is that currently in the schools, they teach uh, their pupils that Ukraine was created by Lenin in uh, somewhere like in 50s of the 20th century. Uh, but according to the history that I learned and in the buildings of my city, uh, Ukraine, uh, Kiev uh, Rus was created in 882. So it's like, it doesn't really match. Um, and uh, one of the scenarios that they may um, conduct is destroying all Kiev so that we have the buildings that prove the history. Uh, and that would be really horrible. Um, but uh, I want to show you the latest proof of their propaganda and extremely painful. Um, so maybe you heard about these three cities that were released uh, recently, Bucha, Irpin and Hostomel. Um, no really sensitive content. Uh, please don't Google these pictures. Um, but I want to show you what, uh, what was before and after. So this is the typical building of these three towns um, before. Lots of parks, uh, lots of um, pine trees, uh, pine forests. It was a, a perfect area to have a walk and we went there many times. Um, and this is what it's look now. You see, uh, they say that um, they want Russian world to, 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 to spread. So this is the Russian world um, currently. Um, 
and this is another picture uh, that I found uh, from BBC. And uh, the way they quote uh, these three cities is um, cities of corpses, buried tanks, burned tanks that stopped Russian offensive uh, to go to Kyiv. Um, well, this is not the price we wanted to pay. Um, and another huge loss for us was, uh, maybe you know about the aircraft called Maria, Dream from Ukrainian, the largest aircraft in the world that was transporting the largest um, things around the world. And this is what it looks now. Really very, very deep pain for every Ukrainian. Um, Ah, and what about the propaganda? Uh, so in Russian media, they say that this is all Ukrainians doing after Russian troops left. But thank you, New York Times, um, uh, for providing uh, pictures uh, with satellites uh, and showing that uh, this was all happening during uh, Russian world there. And the language issue. This is the third reason for Russia. Here, uh, I want to show, uh, share my personal story. Um, so when I was 13, uh, I moved from a small city in central Ukraine to Kyiv. And uh, I had a choice what language to speak, Ukrainian or Russian. Because, you know, big city, you are a very, very little girl. Mm, and I was always living uh, until 13 in this like dual language world. So um, the half of TV was in Russian, half of TV was in Ukrainian, not really much discussion about uh, nation, nation, about what it is to be Ukrainian, uh, but we have had this um, perception of Russian language as modern, like cool language, and Ukrainian sort of rural language, no one wants to speak it. So when I moved to Kyiv in 13, um, I had a choice and I made the choice to speak Russian. And I spoke Russian for a couple of years with my friends uh, um, in the school. Uh, and then um, I had, you know, all these um, th things in my head. Why do I need to make um, this choice? Like, why do I need to change language? Uh, but really, the, no discussion at that time in the media. So yeah, I'm like Russian and Ukrainian, Ukrainian and Russian. I was switching constantly. Um, and then um, I was thinking where to go, which university to enter. Mm, my family could not afford paying for me. Uh, so I chose uh, uh, the university that uh, was corruption free, uh, Kyiv Mahila Academy. Uh, it was the only university that was corrupt free uh, back in 2003 when I was applying to university. Um, so I made this choice ba only basing my uh, um, goal on the interest that I don't want to pay money. And I went to this university, I talked to different people, like you feel the atmosphere when you get into some uh, in institution. So I fell in love with it, with Ukrainian culture, with uh, patriotism. And besides corruption free, it was only the only one university that was pro-Ukrainian, like really pro-Ukrainian, Ukrainian speaking and uh, spreading this patriotism. Uh, so um, I decided to go uh, to try to enter this university and I failed. They did not accept me. Uh, my grades were not enough. But because I was really in love with them, I decided to enter it. Um, and I spent one year preparing and next year I became student of it. I work there still, I pay back because it really changed my life. So no duality in languages since then. I'm very pro-Ukrainian, uh, pro-Ukrainian speaking. Um, and uh, yeah, it's quite hard to explain to many people around abroad, uh, this language duality. They say, why you don't have like two state languages? Mm, but for us, it's a principal uh, moment uh, because we believe that language in our context, it's all the, the values, it's also the values. Maybe we can discuss it later in the, during these sessions. Um, and there was a quotation um, by, Putin's ex-wife, I don't know her name and I don't care about her name, borders of the Russian world pass where the borders of the Russian language pass. It is their message. And language is one of the key points in the discussions now between uh, Russian and Ukrainian um, groups um, that we are all seeing in the news. It is very key point for Russia to have 
Russian language as a second state in Ukraine. Uh, and now talk about, let's talk about Ukraine. So we had really too high trust in international law and international agreements. The most famous, of course, is the Budapest Memorandum signed back in 1994 that was um, aimed to provide security assurances for us for giving up a nuclear weapon. And Russia, as one of the countries who signed this agreement, uh, made a commitment to respect the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Well, we see how one of the countries who signed it um, works on this commitment right now. Uh, and the second uh, reason from the Ukrainian side, uh, I would say, is pro-Russian presidents. We had a couple of them, and they really were, uh, were very strong uh, in their messages. Um, and an obvious pro-Russian policy. Also, what I mentioned uh, before in the news, in the media, um, it is not, uh, you know, like obvious, you speak Ukrainian, ah, you love Ukraine. You speak Russian, you, you don't like Ukraine. No, it, it's very blurred. Uh, it's not uh, uh, always clear. Um, and uh, sometimes I even make mistakes in, in these choices. Uh, so that was about the reasons that I selected for the lecture today. Um, the message that uh, Russia is spreading, as I see with this war, is the world that does not recognize Russia's greatness should not exist. And basically they are doing genocide in Ukraine, um, destroying all of us. Mm, yeah. And I want to finish with the uh, two pictures. One of them is... Whew, um, I referred to uh, the plane before, the aircraft Mriya. Uh, so this is the picture of real person, real family. As you know, millions of us are now spread all around the world. And uh, one of my friends is hosting, uh, she lives in, in France near Paris. She's hosting another family. And uh, they found out that this boy, uh, he loved, <sighs> he loved this aircraft. So, yeah, they made this picture for him. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to not to cry. And this is how people in the villages, they greet <laughs> Ukrainian soldiers. <laughs> yeah, that's all from me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Neshevenko, for everything you shared with us today. Um, I'll now turn it over to Mr. Smith, if you're ready. Yes, thank you so much. Um, and first, um, I just wanted to say um, to Professor uh, Neshevenko, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I can't even imagine uh, what you're going through right now, and um, you know, all of our our hearts are with you, and uh, and with all of the Ukrainian people. Um, let me try to uh, to share my screen. Okay, um, it says that screen sharing is uh, disabled. Um, Ah, oh, here we go. Okay, well, thank you all so much. And um, again, thank you for the, the, the stirring uh, presentation. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Nezhevenko. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Smith. Um, so I am a uh, US uh, diplomat. Um, and uh, as such, I am legally required <laughs> to say at the beginning that I'm, I'm speaking right now uh, in my personal capacity um, and that these opinions are um, my own exclusively, um, you know, and not necessarily those of the US government. So I served uh, in Kiev uh, 2012 to 2014 um, as uh, part of the uh, economic team um, at the embassy, uh, never imagining um, that I would be there for the uh, momentous events of Euromaidan 
Um, let me just uh, start out by saying a huge thank you to Executive Director uh, Dina Mansour um, for organizing this, um, and especially Dr. Stephen Levine, um, who um, gets a special mention as without him, this book would not exist. Uh, he uh, ended up being my, my writing partner for years and years, and um, yet without him, there, there certainly would be no book. Um, so quickly, um, why Euromaidan? Why is it so important? Um, to me, it was important because it was a fun, it was a turning point. Uh, when I arrived in Ukraine in uh, 2012, there was no thought that there could ever be conflict between Ukraine and Russia, um, especially not military conflicts. You know, the, uh, these conflicts, they played out in uh, newspaper editorials and boardrooms, um, not on, on the battlefield. Um, by the time I left, uh, Russian troops were in Ukraine, um, where they have remained uh, to this day. Um, but I, I must say my real motivating factor for doing this um, was actually anger and frustration with um, all of the lies uh, coming out of the, the Russian Federation. Um, three specific lies uh, you know, that I just wanted to highlight um, one was that um, somehow the U.S. embassy and U.S. government um, that, uh, you know, we were sponsoring or somehow behind Euromaidan. This was very important for um, uh, the Russian government to try to uh, claim that Euromaidan was something other than it really was. It was an anti-corruption revolution. Um, that really didn't have much to do with America or Russia or anyone outside of Ukraine. Um, but um, that fact um, made it quite threatening to Russia. Uh, the fact that a people, you know, so similar to Russians um, could rise up and try to root out corruption from their society. Um, that's something that definitely um, what was treated as a threat by the, the Kremlin um, and led to their attempts to label Euromaidan, first of all, as a tool of the West, um, and second of all, as, um, uh, you know, somehow Nazi or fascist, um, you know, in a country like Russia that plays on World War II myths, um, so often and so hard, um, you know, that was a uh, disingenuous but kind of easy way um, to try to turn people against uh, what was going on uh, in Ukraine. Uh, the third big lie was um, that somehow what was happening in uh, the East uh, and Crimea was an organic activity um, of, uh, you know, people who lived there who were pro-Russian and rose up against Kiev. Uh, in truth, um, this was uh, the result of an armed incursion uh, from Russia. So um, in the beginning, I um, introduced myself uh, as the narrator and uh, tell a bit about my background as a kid from Florida who uh, eventually became a diplomat um, and then um, went through some of the uh, Ukrainian history, um, going back to Kievian Rus um, in the uh, 10th through 13th centuries, which is kind of the, the core state that founded both Ukraine and modern day Russia, um, going through the Mongol conquest, going through the uh, Cossack Hetmanets, um, and in the late 1800s, early 1900s, the growing sense of uh, cultural identity um, in Ukraine. There's a picture here of Taras Shevchenko, uh, the great Ukrainian poet, um, really making the Ukrainian language you know, a form of, of high culture. Um, after the First World War, when uh, the Tsarist Empire went into uh, chaos, um, so did uh, Ukraine um, up until 1922, um, when Ukrainian Bolsheviks created the uh, Ukrainian uh, SSR, which eventually uh, then joined the, uh, the Soviet Union. Um, Holodomor, um, which was the intentional starvation of Ukrainians in the 1930s uh, by Joseph Stalin, um, is still a tremendous um, part of the cultural identity of Ukraine. Um, Ukraine eventually became kind of the breadbasket of the Soviet Union and one of the great industrial hubs. Um, th there were many incidents along the way. The Chernobyl accident in uh, 1986 also forever changed Ukraine. Um, and then finally in 1991, there was independence. Um, the 
uh, heads of state of um, Ukraine and uh, Belarus and the Russian Federation uh, joined together um, to sign the uh, Belaveja Accords, uh, which split up the Soviet Union. But uh, it's very important to remember that Russia was a key player in, uh, in breaking up the Soviet Union, which is something that you don't hear as much now in uh, Putin's uh, portrayal of history. Um, so after that, Ukraine had kind of a, a, a mixed record of, uh, you know, uh, independence, uh, with some periods of, uh, you know, economic growth, other uh, kind of sluggish uh, periods. Um, in 2000, uh, early 2000s, there was the Orange Revolution, um, in which people took to the streets um, to protest um, a corrupt election. Um, and it was uh, through that that Viktor Yanukovych um, did not receive the presidency. And uh, he was later in the late 2000s elected uh, probably fairly that time, uh, but clearly never forgot the sting of uh, what happened when people came out into the streets. Um, so chapter three is all about corruption in Ukraine because it's, it's impossible to understand what happened um, at Euromaidan and why without understanding corruption. Um, I dealt with it in my job almost every day. Um, these are pictures um, of Mezhihiria, which was Viktor Yanukovych's personal estate um, uh, put together um, after a number of shady privatization deals um, on formerly state-owned land. So chapter four um, is, um, is about um, the tilt of the balance, um, really in um, August, October, 2013. Um, throughout Viktor Yanukovych's presidency, um, he sought to straddle both sides of the fence, um, to get a little closer to Europe, get a little closer to Putin, um, and really try to get concessions from both sides uh, you know, in order to, um, to go their way. Um, Yanukovych acted like he was going to, uh, to sign an association agreement with the European Union. Um, and then after a last minute trip to see Putin, um, he announced uh, that he was not. Uh, there's also a picture here of Yulia Tymoshenko, a uh, former prime minister um, of Ukraine. Um, she was arrested um, by Viktor Yanukovych and her fate uh, in jail was a major part of the back and forth uh, between, um, between the EU and Ukraine. Uh, after Yanukovych um, announced that he was not going to sign, uh, there were several hundred students in late November um, who came out onto the streets. Um, these were mostly um, young people who felt that the association agreement and getting closer to Europe was really Ukraine's chance. Um, to uh, jettison um, the history of corruption um, and to, um, to make a more European Ukraine. Um, you know, if European countries could have, you know, a, a nations where you didn't have to pay off police officers and, um, you know, where things worked better than Ukraine, um, then why couldn't they? Um, so it was very small, these protests, um, until the morning, until the evening of November 30th, um, uh, 2013, uh, when in the middle of the night, uh, Viktor Yanukovych um, sent in riot police with uh, truncheons um, to beat students. Um, so this became a major turning point um, in a protest movement that probably would have dwindled off um, in, in days um, after, uh, after this event. Um, there were first tens and then hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians um, out on the street. So it was during this time period when um, our embassy started sending out observation teams onto the square um, so that we would know um, what was happening. Um, during this entire time period, um, our main goal at the embassy was to um, just to understand what was happening and why. Um, so that we could um, let Washington know, so that Washington could make um, their best decisions. Um, that was really the, the beginning and end of what we were trying to do uh, during that time period. Um, it's important to know just uh, geographically the Maidan, um, you know, that's uh, in Ukrainian, that's uh, Independence Square. Um, it's um, 
one of the largest squares in Europe. And uh, underneath it is a massive shopping mall. Um, so uh, protesters actually could go up, uh, up top and uh, protest and carry signs and uh, go underneath then and buy uh, shoes and gelato. And uh, that uh, you know, was one of those uh, kind of incongruous sorts of, sorts of things. It, it was during this time period that we also got a much better understanding of the Russian line um, on Euromaidan. Uh, we would often see Russian journalists uh, walking through the square, uh, saying things in, in uh, stand-up um, uh, scenes uh, that were completely bizarre. Uh, I remember seeing one journalist walking through the square, um, declaring that everyone around them was a uh, drug addict who was paid in food and heroin by the CIA to be there. Um, you know, had there not been such a kind of peace and love vibe on the square, um, it could have gotten bad for them. Uh, but I think most of the uh, the protesters uh, tried to deal with it um, with uh, with good humor. Um, you know, I, I had other Ukrainian friends um, who gave me behind the scenes tours um, of uh, what was going on on the square. The tremendous amount of, of self-organization of the protesters um, who, um, as soon as a newcomer would arrive, uh, would assign them a place to sleep, um, would get them to volunteer for a position on the square, um, and to uh, make sure that food was flowing. Um, it, was, it was something like I had never seen before. So um, the next chapter goes more into uh, the following months. Um, Euromaidan um, had opened Maidan University. They would invite some of the best uh, minds in the country to, to deliver uh, free lectures. Um, you can see a picture here of uh, kind of the ramshackle barricades at the time. Um, underneath is a picture of Tatiana Chernovil. Um, she was a, a journalist um, who was um, run off the road. Um, and, and beaten um, by, um, well, thugs. Um, she recovered um, and eventually, um, after all of this was over, um, became a minister in the new government. So the um, peaceful period of Euromaidan ended in the middle of January, 2014, um, when there was a, um, a series of laws um, that were passed by the Ukrainian Rada um, by Viktor Yanukovych's party um, called the dictatorship laws, um, immediately banning um, much of what the protesters did, imposing harsh prison sentences for group violations of public order, um, for wearing helmets. Um, and uh, this led to a much more violent period. Um, it also led to uh, the government um, employing uh, titushki or um, uh, paid thugs um, to come and, uh, and threaten protesters. So it was during this time period that um, I was sent to, uh, to Crimea uh, with a team to, um, to meet people and try to figure out what was going on there. Um, the head of the Crimean parliament was uh, spending a lot of time in Moscow um, during this time period. Um, and um, the local Crimean government was um, employing local TV um, to try to drum up uh, sentiment against Euromaidan, again, pushing this, this um, very bizarre line that we've heard so much today, you know, that, um, you know, the, what's going on in, uh, in Kiev had something to do with uh, right-wing uh, militia groups. Um, after that, we went to uh, Zaporizhia. Um, what we heard, um, okay, at the bottom here is a, a, a picture of uh, Ukrainian Tartar television. Um, we, we spent some time with them and learned um, just how worried the Crimean Tartars were about, about events uh, that were transpiring there. But I, I would say at the time, none of us suspected um, that there was about to actually be an invasion. Um, and um, it, the way things transpired, even if things looked bad, um, was still um, was still shocking. So the next chapter deals um, with um, those terrible three days in the middle of uh, of February, where um, it looked as if there 
was going to be a peaceful end to the Euromaidan protests. Uh, Viktor Yanukovych had signed a new agreement um, with the main opposition parties. Um, everyone had agreed um, to back off. Um, it looked like it was over. Um, and then February 20th, um, 2014, um, there was a uh, mass murder on the square. Um, snipers fired from, uh, from various directions, um, killing more than 60 people um, on the square. But I think quite in um, contradiction to what the organizers um, of that murder expected, uh, the protesters did not leave. However, uh, Viktor Yanukovych, the president of Ukraine, did. Um, he um, uh, fled and uh, later uh, popped up in Russia. So chapter 10 deals more with um, Kremlin uh, propaganda efforts. Uh, you'll see here, uh, this is one um, uh, propaganda sign um, in Crimea uh, before the referendum uh, on the, you know, saying either you have a choice for a Russian uh, Crimea or a Nazi Crimea. This is fairly typical Russian propaganda. Um, also during this time period, um, you know, I, I um, had to reach out and, and see what had happened to some people I met with. Uh, when I was in Crimea, I had met with um, a young man who was the head of Euromaidan Crimea. Um, a, uh, you know, very, very nice guy with uh, no international focus, really. I mean, his, his focus was anti-corruption, um, getting the streets cleaned, um, getting his, uh, his kids school better. Um, you know, I left and because he wasn't very interested in international affairs, um, I had never, I never really expected to uh, see him again or uh, talk to him again. Um, shortly after the invasion, um, he was um, arrested and taken to an a impromptu torture uh, facility in Crimea. Um, eventually, he got out through a prisoner exchange. Um, but to this day, um, you know, when people say that, uh, you know, there was a, an election in Crimea, um, you know, it, it's difficult for me to see an election that happened after people were already being tortured for their political beliefs. Uh, to be much of an election at all. So um, chapter 11 deals um, much more directly with um, the actual seizure um, of Crimea, how it was, uh, how it was accomplished. Um, it was very quiet, um, but for those who claim that it was not violent, um, there are many examples um, to the contrary. Ah, and I was just speaking of um, uh, Andre Shekun. That's a picture of him and his family uh, there. Um, so chapter 12 deals more with um, uh, the, the finalization of the theft of Crimea um, and um, Russian attempts to um, open up um, Eastern Ukraine. Um, I uh, traveled to Donetsk um, a few weeks um, before um, a, a few weeks before um, the Russian invasion. Um, and um, the big takeaway to me was that th there really wasn't a domestic um, constituency for uh, saying that Donetsk should not be Ukraine or, or Lugansk should not be Ukraine. Um, we were uh, talking to even, you know, very pro-nationalist people there, um, you know, people who were very disappointed by Euromaidan and people who were strong supporters of Viktor Yanukovych, especially uh, in Donetsk, as that's his hometown. Um, still, there were, we didn't find anyone asking questions like, um, should Donetsk be Russia? Um, that just wasn't something that was being asked locally. Um, there were protests there, people carrying signs. Uh, saying things like Donetsk is Russia, um, but all of the actual locals we talked to were very skeptical that these were locals. They didn't seem to even recognize local football jerseys, um, and a lot of them were trying to find out um, where these people were from. And the last chapter here um, is about um, 
the terror shockwaves. This is when uh, the little green men actually started infiltrating. Um, up in the upper left here, uh, there's a map that was uh, circulated at the time. Uh, this was an internet meme um, where Russia was showing how they wanted to basically break up Ukraine at the time with the red zone there uh, being the quote unquote Nova Russia or new Russia zone. If you were to compare that um, to um, the actual zone that became this uh, Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics, it's much, much larger. So this clearly did not go according to, uh, to plan uh, for the Russians. Um, and um, it, the last chapter is about the really terrible things that started happening there at the time. Um, this includes uh, hacking of the 2014 elections, the MH17 downing, um, and again, um, you know, how these, uh, you know, quote unquote elections took place in Donetsk and Lugansk, um, you know, basically you have men like, like these in the picture uh, who put up ballot boxes, um, you know, and if you're willing to be trapped in a, a small box, um, you know, surrounded by guys like this, uh, you're probably not uh, voting a way that they don't like. Um, so um, again, to, to call these um, elections representative of the will of the people um, is, uh, is uh, rather laughable. So um, what did it all mean? Um, this is the very last part of the book, thinking about what it, what it meant as an American to be there um, at the time. Um, you know, I think our role in all of this was extremely minimal, um, you know, any kind of statement that we in the US were the prime movers or doing something to seriously influence events, um, it is really kind of self-serving. Uh, you know, the Ukrainian people will always be the ones who determine the entire course of this series of, of events. Um, and they determined it in a way to stand up for their own independence. Um, and to stand up against corruption in favor of their own future and uh, future for their children. Um, what is happening now uh, in Ukraine is, is an unspeakable horror. And um, I truly hope that we as Americans find new ways to do the right thing uh, and support Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith, for everything, all the info you've provided um, for us today. We really appreciate being able to hear from you and Professor Neshevenka. We will start our Q&A session. We have about 10 minutes left before we um, have some closing comments at 1 p.m. Um, I'll start with a question from Ali. Perhaps Mr. Smith can begin, and Oksana, you can follow with your comments. The question is, what are some of the most significant differences between the 2014 invasion of, and annexation of Crimea and the ongoing? Yeah, they're actually surprisingly different. Um, you know, in 2014, first you had the invasion of Crimea. Um, you have to keep in mind that Russian troops were already in Crimea uh, legally. Um, under a basing agreement with Ukraine. Uh, you know, Russia rented out the naval base there and Russia did have the right under certain circumstances to move troops around. Um, so it was very unclear what was happening in those early days, especially because there was no direct relations between the Ukrainian and Russian governments. So how were the Russians supposed to inform the Ukrainians that they were moving troops? You know, in the US, we were very unclear as, as what was happening. And uh, most of those troops would go around without insignia. Uh, the Russians were claiming that um, there were local militias that were doing this. Well, we all know that's not true. But there were all of these claims. Um, and then the same thing happened in Donetsk. These were troops without insignia. Um, and it was all designed to be very sneaky. Um, and it was designed to be kind of under, under deniable cover. Um, what's happening now is not that. It's, it's Russian armored columns, um, you know, undisguised. Um, and it's, it's much larger scale. Um, 
and it covers a much, much larger territory. Yeah, I think I will continue. Uh, I definitely agree with everything that uh, Professor Smith mentioned. Uh, they are very different. Uh, first of all, Crimea is little, Ukraine is large. And uh, back in 2014, uh, 13, 14, they were quite close to one another these years. It was very easy for Russian um, propaganda to get into Crimea because Crimea was small and uh, there was this Chernomorsky float, uh, um, Black Sea, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> troops uh, in Crimea. Uh, so it was much more easier for them to control Crimea back in 2014 um, uh, from the military point and also from the propaganda point. It is much easier to control small area than the large area. Uh, they actually um, expected the same now. They expected uh, Ukraine, all Ukraine, to surrender. They expected, in the worst case scenario, Kyiv surrender, Kharkiv, which is eastern Ukraine, Odessa, which is southern Ukraine, uh, Kherson, Zaporizhia, which is sort of southern eastern Ukraine. None of the cities surrenders. All of the cities fight. Actually, Kherson, who is the south, uh, Ukraine uh, city, and it's uh, now under Russian uh, occupation. Uh, every Sunday, people, peaceful people, go to these protests. I check these pictures. They, the number of these people doesn't go down. Every Sunday, someone is killed from these people, but they go there and they protest because they want to be in Ukraine. And it's really admiring. I really admire these people who are like, almost sure that they will be killed, but they go and they take our flag with them. It, it's really, it's astonishing what's, um, what's in mind of these free people. Uh, in uh, 2014, also Ukraine was very weak when Crimea was uh, annexed because of um, everything that Professor Smith told. Uh, from November to January, there were mass protests. I was also very, very honored to be there. I, I remember this amazing atmosphere of self-organization. I still keep, um, I mean, in Kiev, I have the hat that someone of the volunteers gave me because it was cold and I didn't have a hat. And like, why do you give me the hat? I live in the city, I have a hat, mm, but you need to have a hat, take this hat. And I, of course I keep it as a treasure uh, since then. So Ukraine was very weak and we could not really and react enough to protect Crimea. Um, a current government was accused a couple of times and uh, I believe it was justified, uh, this accusation that they did not do enough. Uh, so Russia, they expected for this moment for Ukraine to be weak and uh, not to have enough really um, military troops after the Yanukovych uh, presidency because it was the end of his presidency. Um, so we did not have any military people to go there and protect Crimea. Um, and the last point that I wanted to say that uh, right now we all saw how the life of uh, people in Crimea and in uh, occupied areas of Donetsk and Luhansk changed. It got much worse. They have um, no freedom of speech. Uh, the prices uh, went up, the salaries went down. Uh, so all Ukraine understands that we do not want to go this scenario. Yeah, I believe our Two answers were quite complete. And thank you for the question. Very, very good question. All right, we have another question, um, a couple of questions actually that came in um, that were pretty similar, but from Kay Buckley and Kelly Gardner. Um, and of course, um, everyone who's coming to these talks today would really like to know um, what specifically they can do to be supporters of Ukraine right now. And I wanted to sort of tag on to that maybe what sort of resources would be best for Americans to look into to understand better what's happening or to understand Ukraine's specific cultural identity. And we'll start with Professor Nizhivyanko. Uh, thank you. So first of all, um, um, really thank those who are thinking about these questions, those who are um, uh, feeling compassionate to me, to all Ukrainians uh, who left our homes, and I'm sorry again for my tears today. Uh, yeah, no pictures for the rest of sessions. Uh, I will try to be more professional. 
um, how you can help, uh, well, spreading uh, the words that, uh, for example, today you saw um, one of the terrorists, one of the Nazis, I seem know that much uh, radical or, or sick, um, that uh, we were forced to leave. I do not want to live in the European Union. I am so happy with my life in Ukraine. I have very good salary. I have very good apartment. Uh, I don't want to go abroad. Uh, I want to live in my home. And we were forced to leave because, I mean, I saw explosion next to my house where my daughter lives. And it's a horror what everyone goes through. Um, right now, we resume studies at the university. And yesterday, I sent email to my students asking, how are you? Where are you? Are you ready to start? And I have 80 students. When I read these emails, oh my God, I asked them one word, if you can write, please write one word. And they are all writing me like letters. Uh, and it's amazing what these people do. Uh, they all want to be back home and live the life that they, they lived before. So yeah, the answer, uh, the best you can do is like spreading the words uh, that it is a bad what's happening in, in my country. If you can support uh, some kind of funds uh, for humanitarian aid, for uh, support to the Ukrainian army. I can share the links with you or you can find them easily. That would be like top of the top. And thank you so much for caring and asking this question. No, and um, uh, Professor Najivenko, I, I think we, we all understand the tear and I, I think we all feel it. Um, you know, um, it's, uh, it's an unbelievable time. Um, you know, as far as uh, information sources, um, the, the other part of the question, um, gosh, I just, I, I think everyone should watch um, uh, President Zelensky's address to the United Nations just from earlier today. Um, you know, that was quite a powerful statement um, on, um, on the current situation uh, and the stakes, not just for Ukraine, um, but for the entire, the entire world. Um, also, um, Ukrainska Pravda, um, they even have an English language um, section. Um, and that's, um, that's a good one to check, um, you know, if you want, uh, you know, a real quick rundown of, um, you know, some of the more granular stuff coming out of Ukraine right now. Wonderful, thank you both. Um, we've approached our closing time, so we'll, we begin with wrap up. Um, thank you to our speakers, Professor Oksana Nezhubyanka and Mr. Chris Smith. And we look forward to next week's session featuring Mansfield Ethics and Public Affairs Director, Dr. Rob Saldin, who will speak to the state of international democracy. Professor Nezhubyanka will be joining us then as well. The recordings will be posted to the Mansfield Center website, as well as our YouTube page, which you can access at www.mansfieldcenter.org. And registration will remain open for anyone who would like to attend the remaining three sessions. Well, and thank you so much to our wonderful moderators. We, we really appreciate it. And I also wanted to just share the opportunity before we get to closing statements here um, that if you are interested in learning more, there's been a Ukrainian film series and fundraiser going on over the past few weeks. Um, they've shown some great informational um, documentaries and Ukrainian films. And the last one is the film Homeward. And it's at the UM studio on the University of Montana campus, um, also known as The Flat, tomorrow at 7 p.m. And they're taking donations to the Global Empowerment Mission. And we will post that information in the chat as well. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Take care and we hope to see you again next week.